chapter 38. That's where we're going to be tonight. I'm going to give you a message entitled, The Last Sermon. Uh, we have been a year and a half in the book of Jeremiah. We have walked with Jeremiah for 41 years through his ministry. And he has beat the same drum, telling us exactly what's coming. We are one chapter away from the fall of Jerusalem. In this chapter, we hear the last sermon he's going to preach, at least in this sense, that Jeremiah will survive the fall of Jerusalem. He'll continue to be used by God and speak to people after that. By the last sermon, I don't mean the last one that he's going to preach forever. I mean the last one he's going to preach to the king. Now, it brings chills to me to think about what I'm about to say, but this king was lost. And God was giving him the last, final opportunity for salvation. This is going to be the last time God ever speaks into this man's life. This will be the last word from God that ever comes to him. And the truth is that we don't know, because life is so fragile and, and things are so delicate, we don't know how long anybody's got. But for everybody on this planet, there will be a last time. There will be a last word that comes. There will be a last opportunity. And for those that know Christ, that don't know Christ, that's why it's so important to take advantage of the opportunity while you have it. Because you don't very often know when the last time is going to be. Jeremiah is going to speak into this man's life for the last time. The last word of warning, the last word of possible salvation is going to come to the king and to the nation through Jeremiah. And then the end is going to come and all will be lost because the message is going to be rejected. But I have something for you tonight to take away from this to think about because you're God's mouthpiece and you're the one called to carry the word into the world and the people that you come in contact with, the people you speak to, you don't know when their last opportunity to hear the word of God is going to be and you may be the last witness that anyone ever hears talk about Jesus and the possibility of salvation. And there's some things we can learn from how Jeremiah is conducting himself in these last days. In fact, you're going to see that as the city is about to fall and the enemy is about to overtake and overrun uh, the walls, that it gets darker for Jeremiah than it's ever been. And so listen to what happens as the story unfolds and think about how Jeremiah, in spite of it all, stays on mission and stays faithful to God. Here's what the Bible says beginning in verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 38. Now Shephatiah the son of Matan and Gedaliah the son of Pasher and Jukal the son of Shelemiah and Pasher the son of Malchijah heard the words that Jeremiah was speaking to all the people saying, Thus says the Lord. He who stays in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Then the official said to the king, now let this man be put to death, inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in this city and all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. So King Je Zedekiah said, Behold, he's in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern there was no water, but there was only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. But Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, while he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. Now the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin, and Ebed Melech went out from the king's palace and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the cistern. And he will die right where he is. Because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. 
Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take thirty men from there, from here under your authority and bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn-out clothes and worn-out rags and threw them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Now put these worn-out clothes and rags under your armpits under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance, that is, in the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Do not hide anything from me. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, you won't, li- won't you certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you won't listen to me. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> But King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Uh, By the way, I wouldn't trust this guy for anything. I don't care what he says, but, um, I mean, he's just a snake. Uh, Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, uh, Zedekiah, notice he doesn't even get to ask his question. Jeremiah's going to answer it before he even asks it. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. The city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then the city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Then King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans, for they may give me over into their hand and they will abuse me. But Jeremiah said, they will not give you over. Please obey the Lord in what I'm saying to you, that it may go well with you and you may live. But if you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has shown me. Then behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And these women will say, Your close friends have misled and overpowered you while your feet were sunk in the mire. They turned back. They will also bring out all your wives and your sons to the Chaldeans. You yourself will not escape from their hand, but will be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned with fire. Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, let no man know about these words and you will not die. But the officials hear, but if the officials hear that I've talked with you, then come and come to you and say to you, tell us now what you said to the king and what the king said to you. Do not hide it from us and we will not put you to death. Then you are to say to them, I was presenting my petition before the king not to make me return to the house of Jonathan to die there. And all the officials came to Jeremiah and questioned him, so he reported to them in accordance with all these words which the king had commanded, and they ceased speaking with him since the conversation had not been overheard. So Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse until the day that Jerusalem was captured. Jeremiah is at the last days with everyone else. And he is, if you remember in the end of chapter 37, let me remember it to you. It says in the last sentence there, Jeremiah remained in the court of the guardhouse. He's in jail. And he's in the court of the guardhouse, which means he's got access to people. Very much like the Apostle Paul would often be jailed or under house arrest and have guards there. He had a captive audience, so he'd preach to them. Jeremiah is doing the same thing. He's trying to help people to stay alive. He's trying to get the word out. Because at this point, the only way you can guarantee your life is going to be saved is if you somehow get over, around, through the wall, somehow, some way, and run out to the Babylonians and surrender, as if you're running out with a white flag and giving yourself up. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to go that great with you when you give yourself up. But in the city at this point, the food has run out. There's nothing left to eat. Uh, There is starvation. There is pestilence. Disease is rampant. 
And the Babylonians are about to come in, which means the sword is coming. There's a lot of people that are getting ready to die. The only way to save your life at this point, surrender to the Babylonians. This is a word that the prophet of God is giving from God. The grace of God is amazing. Because even though God has sent the Babylonians to bring destruction to the people who have turned their back on God, followed after false prophets, followed after false gods and false idols, and cho chosen not to listen to the word of God, but instead rejected God and the men of God, all of these people in all of the city who have become adulterers and liars and swindlers and thieves and everything else that, that Jeremiah has accused them of over all these, this time, yet God in his grace still says to them, this is how you can live. There is a way and there is one way. Now, when Jeremiah begins in verse 2 to say uh, this message, he who stays in the city is going to die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but the one that goes out to the Chaldeans is going to live and have his own life, his booty, and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, the city will certainly be given over to the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Now, to, to a lot of people, they would hear that as treasonous. After all, you've got men who are soldiers who he's giving this message to. They're supposed to fight and defend this city. He's under arrest. He's talking to these soldiers, and he's discouraging them. He's trying to tell them, you're not going to win. You're about to lose, and you're going to die. So they see it as a bad thing. They don't see it as a good thing for Jeremiah to be speaking like this. They want to put a stop to him. They want to end what he's saying, and, and hopefully the morale will lift. But this is very much like when Christians tell people there is a way. There is one way and only one way that you can live. Jesus Christ has died on a cross for our sin. He has risen from the dead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and thou shalt be saved. There is no other name given under heaven and earth whereby men might be saved, but through Jesus Christ you can be saved. Now some would hear that the same way they would hear this message. Well, that's so discouraging. I think there's another way of salvation. I think we can fight for our salvation. I think we can earn our way to heaven. Well, we can do, look another way. And I've got this way that I'm trying to get to God. But there's only one way, Jeremiah says, just like the Christian says, there's only one way. And the person that hears something should gauge what they hear in, in, in this way. Is it true? Not whether I like it or not, not whether it makes me feel good or not, not whether it encourages me or discourages me. The question is, is it true? Because if Jeremiah is speaking truth, then he's trying to save people's lives. He's not trying to harm you. He's trying to help you. But if, but if all you're listening for is for what makes me happy and what makes me encouraged and feel good, then you're going to hear a message like that and probably not going to be encouraged and you're going to try to shut it up. But isn't that how the world treats us? Isn't that what happens to Christians? Shut up. I'm going to shut you down. I don't want to hear what you have to say because I don't like it. But we know that it's true. And the good news is that even though Many, if not most, might all reject what you're saying. Some people might receive it. In fact, later on, what does the king say? He says, if I go over to the Babylonians, when I go over to them, the Jews who have defected, they may give me over into their hands. Some people got out. wonder where they got the idea to leave from. Because there was one man that was telling them what to do. Sounds like somebody might have listened. Finally, somebody may have paid attention. Or maybe they were just hungry enough where they said, we're going to die anyway, we'll just go. But nevertheless, there were some people that got out. Maybe they don't listen to you, maybe they do, but your responsibility is to speak the truth. You have no control over how people respond to you and how they react to what you say. But you need to tell the message. There is a way, there's one way, there's only one way. And you speak the truth, you speak it in love. And you leave the results up to God. Often, though, what you'll find is the results aren't very pleasant. In fact, here's what's going to happen. If you find people 
that do not believe that this word is from God, if you tell them this word, they're going to reject you and reject what you say. Again, if they receive it as truth, like Jesus, when he, we heard him on Sunday morning say, thy word is truth. When he's declaring the word of God to be truth, he's speaking to, to clarify what we all know to be true, that this is from God. It's not a product of man, it's a product of God. And so when you hear from God in this word, you're, God is speaking to you. This is a living word. And it's applicable, and we need to understand it and apply it to our lives today. And so when you hear Jeremiah speak, you're supposed to receive that message as one that comes from God, but they don't. So what happens if you reject the message that God gives as coming from God? Well, you're going to reject the one that gives it, and you're going to reject what they say. That's what begins to happen. So the officials said, let this man be put to death. And as much as he is discouraging the men of war who were left in this city and the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. So they bring this to King Zedekiah in verse 5. And this king, boy, he's a piece of work now, I'm telling you. What leadership here. I mean, have you noticed that every time this king has somebody good, to come, somebody that talks to him, he changes his position. I mean, he waffles. He is back and forth. He won't take a stand and just stay with it. It's like one time he lets Jeremiah out, then he locks him back up, and back and forth and back. And it's the same way that, I mean, his, his whole kingship has been like this because he starts out with the Babylonians, then he flips and goes to the Egyptians, and now the Babylonians are back. And, uh, I mean, it's just over and over again, you just see this guy just like he can't take a, a position and stay with it. He's got no backbone whatsoever. So King Zedekiah says, Behold, he is in your hands. The king can do nothing against you. And this is a, a warning that we need to have. It's, it's kind of like when um, Miami went and played for the national championship against Notre Dame. He said, You know you can't trust the officials. that They'll give it to Notre Dame, and they sure did. Um, well, it's the same way here with the politicians. You can't trust some politicians to take a stand with you. I mean, it's just going to happen. That uh, By the way, I'm not a Miami fan. I am just, just remember Jerry... Jones saying that, or is it Johnson? Anyway, he, uh, you, can't, you can't trust an evil politician to, to help a Christian in a time of need like this. Um, and these men, they're, they're going to do something very evil. And I want you to notice that they've got a clear conscience while they do it. There's a lot of people that will do bad stuff and, and feel like it's okay to do it. And so when... when People that are against Christians and Christianity act against us, know that it's not going to bother them whatsoever, one bit. They're going to feel like they're doing the right thing very often. I mean, that's what you see here in verse 6. They took Jeremiah, they cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son. Now, if you don't know what a cistern is, we, we've seen this before because Jeremiah has talked before about how they had cisterns that would hold no water. These were, think about like a, a small bottle of Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or, or even a pear-shaped something where it's got a small opening at the top, but it comes down. What they would do is they would carve out into the rock uh, the, these places to hold water. And they would catch the water in there, and it would have a small hole at the top. And so you would hope that it would, the water would come in and fill it up, and you'd have water during the dry season. And so that's how you had your water if you're in the city. And you could take and you could put a lid on that, cover it up, and keep the birds from flying over and dropping in it or keep the stuff from evaporating out of it. So, so you've got this cistern that's there in the city that's supposed to catch the water and, and, and help. But what are they going to do? They're going to take Jeremiah and they're going to put him down in this cistern. There's no water down in there. It's all dried up now. They've drank it all. So there's nothing but mud down in there. And he's going to sink maybe up to here, maybe up to here. They're going to let him down in the ropes. They probably said, either get on the rope or we're going to throw you in. And they, they lay him down in there. Hey, have you ever seen that movie, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, way back in the day? It's a great movie if you've never seen it. Not very biblical or historical, but it's a great movie. <laughs> but there's a scene where he finds the Ark of the Covenant. And, he, and he's down in this place and he's surrounded by these snakes and they get it out. They get this other guy out, and he's down there with his girlfriend, and there's this rope that's taking everything out, and he's looking, and it's about time for, for them to get out, and all of a sudden the rope comes falling down. And he looks up, and there's his enemy. 
And he's surrounded by snakes with a few torches, and the torches are about to go out, and you see the lid come over, and it closes, and he's buried alive. Jeremiah is let down in this cistern. He's up to here in the muck and the mire. And it's dark, there's no torches. And more than likely, the lid comes over. And they buried him alive. Now, he's running with horses now. This is tough. You don't know you're getting out of there. And you don't know how long you're going to have to live down there before you die. You don't know that any help's coming. Very much a tough place. Jeremiah is not in this predicament because he's been disobedient to God. He's in this predicament because he's been faithful. He's been obedient. There's a lot of people that think that if you're obedient to God, you've got a promise that you'll be protected, you'll be okay, it'll be all right, you don't have to worry about anything. Let me tell you, being in the middle of God's will is the safest place you can be, but it's also a very dangerous place to be. You got to understand that there's a cost to following God. And so Jeremiah is placed in the cistern. He's sunk in the mire. But there is one thing that Jeremiah had. If you were to go back to his teenage years when God called him, God had actually made a promise to him. I'm going to read it to you. It's been a long time since we were in chapter 1. Here's what God said to Jeremiah when he called him into ministry. He said, Behold, I've made you today as a fortified city, as a pillar of iron and walls of bronze against the whole land, of the kings of Judah to its princes, its priests, and to the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you, listen, to deliver you. God said, Jeremiah, they're going to come to get you, but I got you back. Now, that's all he had as he's buried alive. But if you've got a promise of God in the deepest and darkest times of your life, that's enough. You can hold on to that and just be assured help is coming. It's on the way. You may not know how it's going to come. You don't know how it's going to get there, but it's coming. Here's where it comes. Here's how God sends help. Verse 7, ebed Malek. Now, we don't know that that's his name. Melech, Melech means king. Ebed means servant. So this is servant of the king. It could be his name or it just could be his title. Uh, the Ethiopian. The man that spoke here Sunday night was Ethiopian. So get that picture in your mind if you were here and saw him. This is a guy that looks like him. He is a Gentile. He is probably a slave. He may be a keeper of the harem. Uh, he's in the king's house. He works for the king. He is probably, since he is a eunuch, castrated. And uh, he is not one that would have been allowed to worship God in the temple or the tabernacle. He would have been forbidden from going there. But he is a believer. You know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. This man's got a faith that works. This is a man that would be like an Old Testament good Samaritan. Is he his brother's keeper? He absolutely is. You're going to see him find out what happened to Jeremiah. And when all the others keep their mouth shut and nobody will stand for the man of God and the prophet of God, a Gentile slave eunuch that has no position, nothing, will go stand in front of the king in a public place and ask for Jeremiah's life. Listen to how the story goes. Ebed Malek, the Ethiopian eunuch, while he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. Now the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin. So he's in the place where people would go to pass judgment, and he's sitting there as a judge. Ebed Malek went out from the king's palace, and he spoke to the king. And he said, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly. And all they have done to Jeremiah, the prophet whom they've cast into the cistern. Now understand, they want him dead. They don't, but, but they're not 
man enough to put a sword in his, in his chest. So they're going to let him suffer and die a painful, long-term suffering, agonizing sort of death where you, you're buried alive in this mud and you got no food or water and just evil. They've cast him into the cistern and he's going to die right where he is because of the famine. In other words, he's as good as dead. For there's no more bread in the city. And that's true. It came to the end. And in your mind, when you hear that, to give you an idea of what it was like, have you ever seen pictures of the Holocaust where the soldiers rescued the Jewish victims and, and they didn't have shirts on and you could see their ribs? Do you, do you have a black and white picture in your mind of what it looked like to have been starved out? Now imagine a city full of people like that. There's no food. The king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take 30 men from here under your authority. Bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. So Ebed Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn out clothes and worn out rags. And why did he get those? Because you don't want rug burning, it's going to hurt you and cut you, and you certainly don't want to come out of that muck and mire with scabs and cuts and things so you let the rope down you he's going to put the clothes up under the rope so it'll cushion so he let him down by the ropes in the cistern of jeremiah the, in an ebed malek the ethiopian said to jeremiah now put these worn out clothes and rags under your armpits under the ropes and jeremiah did so and they pulled jeremiah up i don't know what sound that made <laughs> coming up out that mile. i don't know how hard it was to get him out but i know he was glad to be out they pulled jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Now somebody wants to have a talk with him. King Zedekiah sent, and he had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him. At the third entrance that is at the house of the Lord, that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said to Zer Je Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Don't hide it from me. Now this is the last sermon the king is ever going to hear. Is there a word from God? Yes, there is. Now, I asked you this last week after all Jeremiah had been through last week, and I'll ask it again in a different way. You've just been thrown down in the muck and the mire. When they threw him in the cistern, did you read whose cistern it was? It was the king's son. That's whose cistern it was. It's back up in, where was it? I don't know, verse 5. Mal Malachijah, Malachijah, the king's son, it was his cistern. So you've been in the king's son's cistern, buried alive in the muck and the mire. You've got a king that's not worth anything. He is wicked, and he has ruined the nation. How would you answer him? Jeremiah was faithful. He didn't compromise. He didn't back down one bit. There's a word from God. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. It has not changed. I'm not, I'm not giving up, not backing down. I'm not quitting. This is our calling. No matter what the cost, no matter what the price, you carry a cross and you bear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You bear the word of God. You take what God has given and you give it without apology to whoever will listen. There's a word from God. There's a way of salvation. I'm going to tell you exactly how to be saved, King. And if you'll receive it, you'll save yourself, you'll save your family, and you'll save your city. I got a question for you, Jeremiah. I'm going to ask you something. Don't hide it from me. Jeremiah said, I'm going to tell you, but you, you won't listen. If I tell you, you're, not going to, you're going to put me to death probably. And if I give you advice, you won't listen to me. <laughs> Good chance. Yeah, Jeremiah. But the king Zedekiah, he swore to Jeremiah, ah, as the Lord lives. Don't you love it when people speak spiritually and religion? Oh, I promise, as the Lord lives. Well, you don't even know who the Lord is, joker. Uh, he made this life for us. Surely I'm not, not going to put you to death. I'm not going to give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, he probably told him anyway, but at least he got that promise out of him. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel. If you'll go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you'll live. The city will not be burned with fire. Your household will survive. If you won't go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, I mean, do you notice how it's if, 
then statements. And it's conditional. There's an opportunity. This thing, the history has not happened yet. The future is not written in stone. There, there's two different possibilities here. There's a way of life. There's a way of death. I've set before you the path of life. Choose life. What will you do? Here's what God says. Will you act in faith and believe the word of God and live? Or will you, you reject the word of God even though you know it and die? That's the choice. If you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans. They'll burn it with fire. You yourself will not escape from their hand. And what does Zedekiah do? He does what a lot of people do. He does what people do when you share the gospel with them. He makes an excuse. He finds a reason not to obey. What's his excuse? I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans, for they may give me over to the hand, to into their hand, and they will abuse me. In other words, the people that used to be his servants that realized that he should have given them in a long time ago, and they've been smart, and they, he's not listened to their advice and done what they've done. Now that they're in the hand of the Babylonians, he says, well, the Babylonians will give me to them, and they'll just torture me. And Jeremiah says that's not going to happen. But they make an excuse. Proverbs 29 says this, The fear of man brings a snare. He who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Uh, you fear men. He better fear what God's about to do to him. He's worried about what the Jewish people are going to do to him if he surrenders and obeys the word of God. You better worry about what God's going to do to you. The fear of man will keep you from obeying God. That's not just in salvation. That's in about anything because the world will try to push you and push and, and, and get you to, to fall into peer pressure and other things to obey what the world wants you to do. And if you're worried about what people think about you or what they're going to say about you or how they're going to treat you, very often you will choose to not obey God to avoid any kind of negative pain that might come from people. And sometimes people will say no to Jesus because they know that if they say yes to Jesus, it's going to change their life and it's going to change their friendships and they're going to lose friendships and family and other things like that. And they fear people. There's no excuse to, to not believe, to not obey, to not surrender, to not follow, to not listen. But they make an excuse, he makes an excuse. He says, Jeremiah, I dread the Jews. Verse 20, Jeremiah said, they will not give you over. Again, this is the word of God. This is a prophet of God speaking on behalf of God to the king. This is your last opportunity, king. They won't do this. Please, he is pleading with him. This is his enemy. He is pleading with his enemy to be saved. To surrender his life to the Lord and obey the Lord. To walk by faith and trust God that he'll take care of you and he'll provide for him. Please obey the word in what I'm saying to you that it may go well with you and you may live. But if, there it is again, if. If you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has shown me. Now, there are always consequences for disobeying God's word. There are always consequences for rejecting his offers and his offer of salvation, certainly. And so here's what the consequences are going to be. Behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. The royal harem, they had them, as well as his multiple wives, are going to become trophies enjoyed by his enemies. And the women that he was the most intimate with will mock him for his foolish stupidity. So this is the consequence. These women will say, your close friends have misled and overpowered you while your feet were sunk in the mire. They turned back. You remember where Jeremiah was not too long ago? They let him down in the cistern, and he sunk, sunk, sunk down into what? The mire. These women don't know a thing in the world about that. Jeremiah is in the mire because of obedience. 
God's going to let the women that this man used to be with taunt him and say, you're in the mire, big boy. You're stuck. You can't move. You're in a place you're not going to get out of. Jeremiah was in there because of obedience. The king's going to go because of disobedience. Jeremiah's in there out of obedience, and God rescued him out of it. This man's going to walk in disobedience, and there's going to be no salvation that comes. They will also bring out all your wives and your sons to the Chaldeans. I've told you before what's going to happen to his boys. They're going to be killed right before his eyes. They're going to bring your sons out to the Chaldeans. You yourself are not going to escape from their hand. You're going to see it next week after they kill his family in front of him. They're going to blind him and then lock him away for the rest of his life. You're not going to escape out of their hand, but you'll be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and the city will be burned with fire. Now, what I've read, because I'm not that great in Hebrew, and I've got to read people is, uh, that know what they're talking about, is this can be read, you will burn the city with fire. In other words, the city's going to burn because the Babylonians are there, but because this king is so foolish and rejected God's work, it's as if he struck the match and dropped it in the gasoline himself and phoom, the city's burning. In other words, when you reject the word of God and you reject what God wants for your life, very often the consequences spill over into others. And this man in a position of leadership could have walked out, waved a white flag, gone over to the Babylonians, had everybody in the city follow him out, and every one of them would have lived. The city would have survived, and it would never have been burned. But because this man has rejected truth and the one way of salvation, it's going to cost not only him his life, but everybody else their life, and the city is going to be burned to the ground because of it. Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations is going to talk about the smoke coming off as he's miles away looking later on, and he can still see the smoke coming and could probably still hear the explosion from the stones as the, the heat of the fire caused them to burst. King, you're the, the city's going to burn, and you're going to be the one that burns it to the ground because you won't obey God. How many times has there been a family that's been destroyed because a parent in that family wouldn't obey God, and the consequences spilled over into the children? How many times has there been a church that has fallen and never come back because the people in the church wouldn't be obedient to the word of God, and they, they, they'd rather the, the church be destroyed than them submit? I mean, this still happens today. It happens in government. I mean, my goodness, we had a government this past week that wouldn't burn a vote to keep babies alive after they're born because of politics' sake. Let's don't obey God. We want what we want. And so what ends up happening? Jeremiah is freed. Verse 28, Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse until the day, verse 28 says, that Jerusalem was captured. I'll read you what may have come into Jeremiah's thoughts as, uh, as he sat in that guardhouse or maybe that he was down there. This is Psalm 40, and David penned these words. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. Maybe you've been down in that miry clay before and you know what he's talking about. Maybe there's been a time God's rescued you. But I found this to be true as well. You can be in the pit and you can be in the miry clay and your feet can still be on the rock. I think Jeremiah found that. I think he found God faithful no matter where he was. God was true. God delivered him. God did exactly what he said it was going to be. In Lamentations, Jeremiah is going to write, Great is thy faithfulness. We sang it Sunday morning. Jeremiah is down there, and God gave him a promise 41 years before. I am with you. I'll deliver you. God was faithful. But God had given a promise hundreds and hundreds of years ago uh, before that, and he gave it through Moses. You disobey me. You'll eat your own children. You'll be so starving. And I'll carry you out of this land into slavery. And God did exactly what he said he's going to do. 
Great is his faithfulness. People today don't believe that there's a God that would destroy them and cast them in a lake of fire forever. His word is true, and he's faithful. He will do exactly what he said. He's also said, everyone that shall call upon the name of the Lord, put their faith and trust in Jesus, shall be saved. And great is his faithfulness. Because God does what he says he's going to do. Father, I'm thankful that you're true, though every man be a liar. I'm thankful that your word is truth, and we can trust and depend on you no matter what we face. I'm thankful that the promises of God are there for us all, and I'm thankful that no matter what dark place we're in, that you're still the rock upon which we stand, and our feet, if we're in Christ, are always on solid ground. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are the one that gets us up out of that pit and sets our feet on the solid rock. And thank you, Lord, that there's grace and mercy even in the midst of wrath. And that there's always a way of salvation that you offer. It may not be a great way when it comes to a time like Jeremiah was in. But I'm thankful there was always a way. And that you were always sending someone to proclaim it. God, in this day we have a a word about the Son of God alive from the dead that we could proclaim. It's a great way. It's an amazing way. And it's the way of life. God, help us to declare there's a way of life. Choose life. In your name we ask it. Amen.